Welcome to the Intelligent Investing Podcast, where modern portfolio theory can suck it. A student of the school of Graham and Doddsville and a clergy member of the Church of Warren Buffett, here's your host, Eric Schlein. Hi, this is Eric Schlein. You're listening to the Intelligent Investing Podcast. We have Brian Lingus uh, on the show. Welcome, Brian. Thanks, Eric. Uh, thank you for having me back on. It's a pleasure. Yeah, of course. I want to get your take on the, you know, I just did a podcast uh, on Saturday afternoon on the uh, Berkshire Hathaway letter, but wanted to bring you on as a uh, business analyst and a good good investor. Uh, thank you. <laughs> to give us your take on, you know, the letter, um, the interview that was, uh, you know, later done on CNBC uh, just yesterday. Um, so yeah, what was your overall take? Um, this is a classic Warren Buffett. Uh, there are things that never change. And uh, the letter, the interview, uh, contains what you would expect. Uh, more the same. There's no surprises. Warren Buffett, you know, he's known as the internal optimist. Always bet on America. Just the typical stuff. Buying stocks is better than gold. Stocks are better than bonds. Uh, he expects to make money off stocks over time. The letter, you know, there's, there's your occasional Buffett grandpa jokes. Uh, he doesn't, uh, he, you know, every time he has an opportunity to remind us that he's younger than Charlie Munger, he does. He takes a couple of shots at Wall Street. Uh, you know, he has a great comment on the, uh, not avoiding debt, but how to be, you know, be careful on how to use debt. I like that part. Uh, it contains, you know, he always talks about, he brings up some manager by names and then complains about high, val- high valuation, uh, talks about investment fees, you know, buying the index is the best way to invest in stocks. And, uh, yeah, so my take on it is that, you know, there's no, there's no surprises here. Uh, anything investment related. Uh, over the last 50, 55, 60 years plus that he's been doing this, has been said. Was there anything uh, that stuck out to you? Well, um, it's the occasional stuff. What stuck out to me is is it's it's a less of what he didn't include, and it's a recurring t- t- team every year. Uh, I think the part that I uh, I like I guess if you know if you're new to investing or you're not a professional or you simply want to learn more, you turn to this guy, you turn to his letter, right? And uh, Warren Buffett I personally is now, thought it was one of the least interesting letters he's ever written, personally. Well, yeah, there, there's no uh, like there was not, there was nothing that was like whoa. Do you think that's because you're a professional investor or? Because you're looking for higher, deeper insights, right? Like how the insurances are doing, how the insurance company are doing. Yeah, I mean, I think the the letter was just so short, you know, compared to most of them. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think part of it is that I'm a professional investor. But the other part of it, too, is that, you know, perhaps there wasn't much to talk about this year either. I mean, he hasn't really made a big acquisition uh, since Precision right. Cast Parts. Um, yep. I, I think it would have been nice personally um, for him to go a little bit deeper into the businesses. But on the other hand, um, he's also doing something which I've been saying for years now, which is that people get way too into the weeds on each individual subsidiary and it, it ends up not really mattering. Not that it doesn't matter, but that overall it's not like it's, you're going to get some significant edge because you're analyzing every little aspect of right. each individual sub. And he used to go more into detail on the different subsidiaries and he's stepping back from that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think this letter will be known for what he didn't say. Uh, well, yeah. Like, like he talked about the forest and the trees, you know, don't focus on the trees, focus on the forest. Uh, I, as an investor in the company, I wish he talked cause he, he, he dropped a nugget. He talked about these sick trees, the disease trees, Yep. And that some of these companies will not be around in ten years, but he leaves it to that. He doesn't. <laughs> he doesn't. You know, he doesn't. He's not going to say, "Oh, company X need to step it up." But he explained. He explained you know. why he didn't do that in the interview. 
Yeah, then he'll probably turn to Tree G to do the work. <laughs> well, no, no, but, he didn't. I mean, you don't you don't have people working for you and saying, "Hey, your business won't be around in ten years." That's no, it. I know, I know. I'm just joking on yeah. that one. But yeah. uh, no, I mean, I don't uh, look. I mean, if you, if you read the subsidiary subsidiary list, you could probably guess a few of them. Yeah, no, for sure. It, <laughs> it's yeah. I mean, yeah. He he said, "Look, focus on the big horse here. You, you know, uh, the railroad, the." Uh, uh, the energy company, and then a couple of big insurance companies. These 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 two blocks, what he calls them Groves, are are sixty percent, two third of the pre tax profits. Yeah, you know that's your business. Don't worry about, you know, the carpet company. Don't worry about the uh, the frame company. The, the right. No, the I think I, th- I think I think it speaks to a larger issue too. Um, you know, there's a lot of people who in the value investing community they say how much they love buffett but then if you actually look at what they do they're not doing things that um necessarily <laughs> yeah. are that smart and yeah one of the one of the things that i see right charlie munger has actually called this out where he talks about how just because you've spent a lot of time on an idea doesn't mean mm-hmm. that it somehow it makes the idea better correct um, and buffett yeah. talks about how you know, if you start analyzing, you know, every single little detail of of the business, it not necessarily going to give you an edge, and if anything, could just be a, a lot of waste of mental time. And when he says, "Yeah, I made a decision to buy so and so in five minutes," I think a lot of people hear that, but they don't really believe it, right? And the truth is, is that Buffett sometimes will make a decision in five minutes after doing you know years of reading about something, and the I have found in my personal anecdotal experience that there's a lot of people in the investment world who right they're 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 analytical by nature wired more mm-hmm. to be an engineer and there's a linear yeah. there's a linear kind of thinking that takes place with that right so you know if it can't be measured it doesn't exist kind of thinking which of course is insanely stupid um but you have You know, people, they want to just understand the balance sheet and the income statement, the cash flow statement, and that's all great. But when it comes to some of the more intangible, big picture stuff, um, if you can't totally measure it, uh, sometimes people aren't interested. And it's it's always really interesting to me that, you know, you know, I've talked to some some people, you know, for instance, Tom Gaynor, one of the things I really love and respect about him is that Merkel guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He he really really gets uh, the idea of looking at things from a big picture point of view. Um, he gets big ideas. It's funny if I if I run something by Tom Gaynor, he will get it instantly. Where you know, like a lot of other value investors, they won't get it because they need to like analyze and understand it and see all the measurements and data. And it's like you've missed the point, right? If you know, if I was to say, hey, you know. Uh, if you use this product, you'll you'll feel a little happier and have better relationships with your family. Well, now people value happiness and people value better relationships with your family, but you can't really measure that necessarily, right? So people would say, "Well, that product's not stupid because I can't see it." You see what I'm saying? Yeah, I totally, totally. You can't uh, you, you you can't put a number on everything. No, uh, not at all. You not can't at measure all. everything. And that's and, you know, uh, and that's also why I look at say. The investments at Markel and and, and Tom Gainer and I'm a Markel shareholder uh, for full disclosure. But I just I love the culture there. I, I love the management. You know whether it's uh, Tom Gainer or Steve, I, those guys are those guys are 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 really the real deal. And I, I just you know big shout out to those guys over there. Uh, but then there's some other companies uh, who follow similar a platform you know similar uh, operating models on the surface. But then when you listen to them speak, it's like, wow, you don't really get it. Um, so I've always thought that's interesting. Um, and I think that when it comes to Buffett talking about not, not you know, getting too hyper obsessed about every little nitty gritty detail, you know, he talks about that. Yes, I, I'm going to be writing to my sisters, right? He, you know, he talks about in the interview, yeah. I write to my sisters. But yeah. I think in this case, he's also writing to the value community, Um just because these guys are so over analytical, you know, I have a big interest in personal development, and I will tell you that for a, a group of uh, value investors who who pride themselves on being so rational and and so intelligent and smart, 
um, one of the dumbest things that they y- you can do is start learning a lot of wisdom based ideas through reading about books. It's like you, you think you're gonna you think you're gonna learn this from a book and intellectualizing it, you've really missed the point. And um, you know that you know that that's a, that's a perfect example of of, line- of how linear thinking. Uh, in some in some ways can can can, can uh, cloud someone's judgment well you don't learn you don't know how to drive by reading a book you know you don't have they're, a lot they're, they're, you don't learn how to drive by reading a book right and you don't learn how to work out by reading a book um and you don't learn how to play tennis by reading a book you know i, I was very funny it's like it's like someone um you know i, I i've had people before you know because people know that i've done a lot of coaching and personal development work and occasionally I'll have someone, uh, you know, talk to me and they'll, and they'll say something to me thinking that like, I'll, I'll think it's really cool. And I'll be like, you know, I just, I, I've, I've been reading a lot about enlightenment. Okay, cool. That's, that's great. Glad you're, glad you're reading about it. <laughs> well, yeah. How do you, then do, do, you, do you apply it? Do you take it to the next level? Do you, you know, do you see the big picture with this? Uh, what's, well, you know, what's bull- the vision? It's, what's the objective? Bullsh- what's the plan? It's bullshit. It's like, it's, it's, um, it's like if you're, um, a, you know, if if you're a, you know, a bicycle rider and you're trying to read about how to how to balance on a bike, you could read about that for ten years and it won't give you any access to balance. Right. Well, there there are there are experiences, right? Like you need right. There's a you know you need to expose yourself learning. to it. Uh, no, yeah. no, yeah, and I totally, I totally get you mean. Doesn't mean uh, by reading about war, you know what war is. Uh, yeah, you know, there's a there's a, a company uh, that I'm a shareholder in, and one of the aspects to the research that I did in this case, this is not, this is the exception, not the rule, was I actually drove around with one of the employees of the company for a day oh, yeah. and started actually seeing how they interact um, with their customers, and. There was the the only way to understand their model was to experience it, and there was this whole debate going on in Seeking Alpha on whether their business is scammy, whether it's good, and I just decided to actually see it for myself, and I was blown away, and and made these people writing these articles very. It, it was very obvious that they've never actually seen the business in action. Yeah. See, uh, yes, yeah, seeking alpha is an interesting place. Uh, uh, you, you know, you have to uh, like. I, I occasionally write on it and I read articles. Likewise, but, uh, I think you have to look at the credibility of the reader and uh, well, just see look, what he has. I, when I say seeking alpha, I just mean financial journalism in general, right? It, yeah, it's very clear sometimes when uh, a, a writer has never actually been around the business or experienced the business. Well, the industry itself needs. I mean, just just the, the you know we got we got sidetracked here, but this, just the industry of media in general uh, is, is having big problems. You know, they need the click, they need the eyeballs, they need the advertisement money. Uh, but how do you get it? You know, how do you drive traffic? And very often, you just have to do some flashy headlines, something juicy. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's short-term thinking. Uh, you know, if if if, yeah. if journalists up their standard um, with what they wrote about, you know, the long the long game would be you would actually drive more traffic uh, as people trust you more. So a lot a lot a lot of the the um, the articles that are disingenuous, um, you know, they'll they'll know it'll attract clicks, which is great short term profits, but you know, long term they'll actually do it at the expense of their reputation. So it's okay. Yeah. The market has a way yeah. of working itself out like that. Yeah, well, Berkshire Hathaway was a big newspaper guy. Uh, That's true. They own a lot. They own a lot of regional uh, papers. Not sure how they're doing, but uh, it's uh, they're all in, they're business. all in decline. Yeah, yeah. The um, Berkshire Hathaway. Uh, you know, I, I I see. I guess three possible paths forward for uh, Buffett and Company. Okay. Uh, I guess the one that they probably won't do is uh, return cash. Uh, you know, maybe accept that Berkshire Hathaway has to be less ambitious in its future. I don't think they can grow book value uh, at double-digit rates or market share price at double-digit. Now they use that now at double-digit price next 
decade like they used to in the last you know 50 years um maybe they'll repurchase more shares um you know i don't think they'll do a dividend the next options is there's this is what this is pref is number one thing right now for buffett is buying another company that's what he's trying to do and uh, he mentioned in the letter and in the interview and it's not the first time that he mentioned it is that the companies are too expensive good decent companies are very expensive and in a sense buffett is a victim of his own success because he calls somebody they know he has money <laughs> you know what i mean right it's like berkshire had to recall to buy you out you're like okay you know it's not gonna be and the third thing is buying more stocks so wait for a crash or correction and slow it up but uh yeah they're 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 really really big and what, what i find funny is that i i think you know for, for as long as i've been following this company and and reading about buffett they always mention oh you know can't beat the market and i'm over too big oh you know don't bet on us on being the market and years after year or almost every year, uh, they do it. <laughs> they still beat the S&P, even though they keep saying, yeah, we're too big, you know, just by the index. Uh, they still do it. So that's, that's you know, that's, in a sense, pretty amazing. Uh, and uh, I think they're sixth or seventh largest publicly traded company right now. Uh, and the rest of them are just tech. You know, the, the Apple, the Facebook, Microsoft, Amazon, these companies. And there's Berkshire Hathaway, which is, you know, insurance slash industrial uh, uh, company, but yeah, I, I uh, uh, hey. he, he's yeah. Speaking of tech, what did you think of his comments with, with Oracle? Uh that's that's the well, that goes back to what I'm saying. He he's not telling us, you know, the letter and. I mean, didn't you think that was a little weird? It was. He told us, the, you know, he got in the fourth quarter and got out, and he said, I didn't understand it. I got out. So why did you get in? How did you get in? But he never answered it. He's, he said he didn't get it. Got out, but it, just, it, just seems, really it just seems very un like where, huh, I'm going to go invest yeah. in something. Oh, but now a, a few months later, I realize I don't understand it. Yeah, he, he's very good at answering or not answer. You know, he you know, prays. Unless, the unless, side. unless, you know, just hypothetically, he buys Oracle, he thinks he understands the cloud and understands what's going on, and then he has some conversation with Bill Gates, and Bill's like, um, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? And Buffett's like, uh, didn't know about any of that. And then he's like, oh, yeah. maybe I don't understand. Who who knows, right? But, well, he, he was afraid of scoring another IBM, you know, just... Sounded like it. Like he bought IBM, he actually made a little bit of money with it, I think. But his yep. thesis, uh, he he admitted, yeah, I I, I was wrong with IBM. Uh, yeah. But again, it's one of these things. He talks to all his managers. He talks, you know, what do you have? How do you run your system? Well, IBM, IBM, IBM. So he's like, well, I'm just buy IBM. But then you know, things uh, things are changing really fast, and uh, he admits that yeah, it's not his his strong point. Well, I can tell yeah. you, I've I've spoke to people that work at IBM, and they have all reported their culture is kind of broken. Yeah, yeah. I had a friend who uh, actually changed job uh, uh, um, right at the end of two, uh, December 2018. He worked there for 30 years. Wow. And then he, he went to work across the street. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, he worked there for 30 years, and, you know, not – not really good things to say, you know, just kind of down and yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's best days are behind type of attitude. Uh, and, uh, yeah, he changed job to 30 years. I mean, 30 years, that's, that's a marriage, you know what I mean? That's, uh, yeah, you're, you're changing, but, uh, the other thing, you know, I, I just wanted more details on his healthcare venture. I, again, he answered and not answer, you know, right. GP Morgan, Jeff Bezos, uh, didn't really get into the succe- succession plan. Well, actually, uh, actually, I think he did. So, did you notice during the interview where someone asked a question about why Ajit and Greg aren't up there? And he's like, well, they have a mic. But he's like, you know, it's sometimes, at some point, they're going to have to be up there um, when we start, you know, reshuffling things. And by reshuffling things, uh, you know, implying when him and Charlie yeah. die. Which then 
seem to imply that those are the successors. Well, they they've been picked to run stuff, right? They're the two guys running. Right. Uh, no, I I I, yeah. I just thought he gave away a little bit there, saying, "Hey, one day they will be up there, and if they're the ones up there, that probably means they're running the place." Well, that that wouldn't be a surprise, right? If that, no, it's not they, a surprise, but it was yeah, a surprise he went that far to say that. Yeah, um, like I think he might have just slipped it and said, "Yeah, those are my successors." Yeah, I think uh, maybe it's a situation where this one. I thought, one see, I thought that was a, to, I thought that was to, a big deal. I thought that was a huge deal. He said that. Yeah. He literally How do you just, think? He literally just said, "Greg and Ajit are going to be up there when we die." He literally said that. Yeah. Well, and there why, you go. Why they're, was that? Why was that not big news? Well, they're the guys, right? Greg is running the operations, and Ajit is running yeah, the insurance. But, uh, yeah, but they, we've all kind of assumed that, but he, he's never actually said one day they will be up there. They should be up there now. I agree, but do you see what I'm saying? That he's never said one day they will be up there until yesterday? Yeah. And why wasn't that big news? Yeah, well, what about Todd and uh, Todd and Tom? Tom and, Todd Tom and Tom, T- is that what they are? Ted. Ted. Yeah, yeah. But they're just investing. They're not... Manage, they're not op, running operations. What do you think about his Apple move? Um, I think that for managing smaller amounts of capital and having a limited capital base, it probably felt appropriate in in their, one of their minds. Yeah, they found something yeah. better. Got to remember they're yeah. playing. They're playing as Buffett said. They're playing a different game, right? You know, Buffett's managing tons of money and gets new cash every quarter. Ted and Todd have, yeah. a, have a have a set capital base, so if they find something new, they have to sell something to buy something else. It's a different yeah. game. Yeah, the uh, I think they each manage thirteen billion. Thirteen billion, yeah. Yeah, and then they get to grow that. Uh, and uh, no, I think it's gonna be the typical thing. The letter comes out, and then the buffer haters, you know, they come yeah. out. And then every time they get a chance to quote him, they will. <laughs> I, I think we need a um, we need a big event for um, for something interesting, really interesting to be in the letter. Oh, the other thing too that I thought was inter- interesting in the interview, and then I think we should wrap up. Um, is yeah. you know it was a little. Str- I will tell you. So when I did my podcast uh, on Saturday, one of the things that I said that I thought was a little weird was that you know the market was down a lot in the fourth quarter. Except mm-hmm. the buyback activity was super light, and you know, I just assumed that when we saw the marketable securities, um, there wasn't a lot of buys in marketable right. securities. I just assumed that the buyback program was significant that quarter. And then when it comes out, oh, they they bought almost back nothing. That would really move the needle. I was kind yeah. of shocked to be honest. I was like, okay, that doesn't really add up. It was. I, I did like that Buffett provided some clarity, saying that you know he thought he was going to be bagging another another elephant and. Things yeah. kind of broke down, so that that provided some clarity onto why he didn't uh, take advantage of those lower prices in the fourth quarter. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, that's it. But uh, yeah, and also this company, you had to be careful, uh, you know, not to look at quarter to quarter because they they don't they don't look at it either. But yeah, I think he's getting impatient a little bit with uh, what he's sitting over. He's sitting on over a hundred billion. Well, and, they, they uh, did say they did say. It might have been three years ago that if we're back here in three years and we haven't used that cash, that would that would uh, not be acceptable. That's right. That's right. Hey, we didn't talk about Kraft. Kraft Heinz. Oh, yeah. What about it? Uh, well, I think, uh, yeah, the stock took a massive beating. Uh, but I think there's an overreaction is from, not Kraft, but from the Berkshire side of things. You know, the whole headline is, oh, Buffett made a mistake. Oh, Buffett took a $4 billion hit. But he did make a mistake. He uh, <laughs> he did. He, he, he did. Uh, but when you look at it from the big picture, the $4 billion loss is, you know, 0.5% of his assets or 1% yeah, of his sure. food value. Yeah. So his stock portfolio swings $2 billion per day, up or down. Yeah. You know, so... You know, I think he's gonna be fine with Kraft. He, uh, he, he, yeah, he said that he overpaid for uh, was it Kraft Heinz? One, one of the two. He bought Heinz first, right? He bought Heinz. He bought Heinz, Heinz first. And then they bought Kraft, and then he screwed up on Kraft. But uh, hey, yeah, I'm, I'm just curious. Yeah. Is, with your accent, is it hard to pronounce H's? Uh, I just noticed that. Um, sometimes I forget it. 
That's what is happens. That, is, that a, is that a French thing or is that a Canadian, French-Canadian thing? No, it's a French thing because we don't pronounce the H in, in uh, French. So we just skip it. Uh, even <laughs> like, you know, like, like hospital in English, you pronounce the H, right? Of course. And in French, it's hôpital. But the H is there, oh, but we okay. skip it. Got it. So it depends on the word. I mean, I'm, I'm, but you can say it, right? Like you can yeah, say Heinz, it. Heinz, Heinz, and uh, hot. Yeah. It's, it's well, because you know how there's some there's some um, some dialects that have a hard time saying certain kinds of words. Oh yeah. That's oh yeah. Right. Oh yeah. Uh, for sure. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No. Uh, uh, I I think it's it gets harder when a war has you know force. Sills. <laughs> yeah. When the word is long, but uh, no, most of the time. Uh, you know, I guess eighty percent of the time it's fine. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I think we should wrap it up, Brian. It was uh, yeah, a fine. pleasure to have you on, and uh, good chat. And uh, I'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Eric. Absolutely. You have yourself a good day. Thank you. You too. Take care. Bye bye. Thank you for listening to the Intelligent Investing Podcast with Eric Schlein. If you'd like to connect with Eric for questions, comments, feedback, ideas, or to inquire about being on the show, please contact Eric at intelligentinvesting at gmail.com. So, in the words of Charlie Munger, I have nothing to add.